welcome to Newcastle Family History Society podcasts. The Newcastle Family History Society, located on a Awabakal land in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia, provides support for those interested in family history. Jane Ison continues the story of the girls of the Newcastle Industrial School and in this episode looks at the riots that occurred, in particular the first riot in 1868. Statutory declarations collected about that right tell the story from both sides. In the second podcast in the Bad Girls series, I told tales of some of the escapes made by inmates of the Newcastle Industrial School. These escapes, however, were less of a concern to the local residents than was the persistent provocative or at times destructive behaviour and the wild rioting of the girls. The biggest concern for the increasingly genteel population of Newcastle was the location of the school near their homes. What they could see and hear was particularly shocking. The school was right in the middle of the town and on a protected site that had been excavated to build a parade ground for the military. So the school became infamous across the country and its inhabitants developed a reputation. Newspaper reports about incidents were subsequently described using sensational language and events were often rehashed in follow-up articles, thus giving the impression that new incidents had occurred. Reporting was so full-on that in recent times many people have compared the school and its charges to the fictional English school St Trinian's. Today we may now be able to laugh at what occurred, but at the same time we must remember that these were children. Rioting was a surprisingly rare event at Newcastle given all the bad press that each riot provoked. During the nearly four years that the school was in Newcastle, there were only three riots. Yes, three. Sure, there were on-site protests and rebellious acts by individuals, but only three major riots, and each occurred under the charge of a different superintendent. And each one was a protest. Why they occurred at all has been almost always the result of speculation, both now and in the past. Yet only the first in 1868 was a protest about mistreatment within the school. No matter what the press wrote at the time about the second and third riots occurring in 1871, I would argue that those final riots were protests about events yet to come, and I will discuss them in a later podcast. Agnes King had been the matron superintendent in Newcastle since August 1867. She took on this role when the appointed superintendent refused to take the position. Perhaps he saw the role as a poisoned chalice even then. King successfully dealt with pushback from Thomas McCormack, the first clerk and storekeeper at the school, by dismissing him in April 1868. McCormack didn't go quietly. There was a war of words between the editor of the Newcastle Pilot who supported McCormack and the powerful Dr Richard Harris supporting King and writing in the Newcastle Chronicle. Harris probably summed up the situation best by stating, McCormack being a man of great importance, he considered it a degradation to hold a subordinate situation in the institution, particularly when his superior officer happened to be a female. Every attempt was made to correct this fantasy, but in vain. All his eccentricities originated in this mistake, and up to the instant of his dismissal, of which, by the by, he had nearly two months' notice, he could not divest his mind of the idea that the McCormack, and he alone, was destined to rule the institution. While King had Harris's strong support, the bad publicity resulting from McCormack's dismissal was probably the first nail in the coffin of her superintendency. The first riot, which occurred about three months later, on the 9th of July, was probably the second. 
Listeners may recall that the makeup of the inmates in 1868 was skewed towards older, generally streetwise girls. Over time, the press began to refer to these older girls, especially using the facetious description of angels. There was still no reformatory in 1868, and many old girls who had been convicted of a crime at the time of their arrest had been placed in the industrial school rather than in a jail. These inmates were generally the girls who were involved in the first riot that was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald. A serious disturbance took place at the industrial school on Thursday morning, which resulted in eight or ten of the inmates being marched off to the watch house by the police. It appears that a number of the elder girls have been very refractory during the past few days, and on several occasions within that period their conduct has been so outrageous that the superintendent was compelled to inflict the only punishment that was allowed under the regulations of the institution, confinement in the cells or outbuildings which were formerly used as kitchens. About 10 o'clock yesterday morning, the discontent prevailing among the imprisoned fair ones manifested itself in an open riot, and it would appear that a number of them, 15 or 20 we have been informed, having armed themselves with various missiles in the shape of brickbats, stones and billets of wood, made a determined attack on the apartments occupied by the superintendent. And having demolished the windows and done as much damage as they possibly could with the means at their command, intimated their intention of wreaking a summary vengeance on Mrs King. When that lady fortunately managed to lock herself in and keep the rioters at bay until a detachment of police arrived and put a stop to their proceedings. On being taken into custody, the promoters of the disturbance were marched off to the lockup and placed in durance file, where they will remain until the court opens this morning, when it is to be hoped they will be dealt with in a manner that will prevent such disgraceful exhibitions for the future. It is stated by persons living in the neighbourhood of the school that the language which may be heard as far away as New Common Street occasionally is perfectly horrible. And latterly, the girls confined in the institution have been encouraged in their outrageous conduct by a number of vagabonds who are in the habit of congregating outside the walls and inciting them to revolt. Yet this riot was far worse than what was reported. However, the details of the actual events never reached the ears of the public. An internal inquiry was undertaken and 50 pages of first-hand accounts were transcribed by McCormack's replacement Frederick Kane, and sent to Sydney. These statements have been reproduced in full on my website if listeners would like to read further. The accounts suggest that the appointment of Martha Ravenhill, a new house matron, greatly upset the inmates of the school. While Ravenhill supported Agnes King, statements made by both staff and rioters described her as unkind and it is possible that her attitude spread through the school. Comments about Ravenhill featured in every statement made to Kane. Also named in every statement was one of the rioters, Sarah Jane Wildgust. Sarah had had a most dreadful life before her admission to Newcastle. Her mother was the transportee Anne Donnelly, who died in Goulburn, New South Wales, shortly after this riot. Sarah's father remains elusive, but he is believed to have had the surname Hanlon. When William Wildgust and Anne Donnelly married, Sarah acquired her stepfather's surname. By the age of 12, she had been working for and often living with Goulburn locals. By 1866, Sarah had briefly moved to Sydney and was working as a servant under an assumed name. She may have been avoiding any association with her stepfather, who was well known, but not always upright citizen of Goulburn, who appeared in the Goulburn courts charged with operating brothels 
or boardy houses. From 1865, Sarah appeared in the Goulburn and Sydney courts charged with larceny. She was jailed after both appearances. Dr Harris spoke to her around the time of McCormack's dismissal and included Sarah's description of her incarcerations in his letter to the Newcastle Chronicle in April 1868. He recalled, This morning I questioned one of these girls. She spoke to me freely of her past life. She had been 16 months in Goulburn Jail, 11 of which she was in solitary confinement in a cell which she described to be a very small room with a very small grating near the ceiling. It was boarded but had no furniture of any kind. Her bed was brought in at 5pm and removed at 6am. She next spent three months in Darlinghurst Jail, a good part of which time she spent in the cells. She described them as about the same size as those of Goulburn, but with stone floors and no furniture except a stool. She spent another month in Goulburn Jail. Sarah had a difficult time living on local farms, and at one court appearance she charged a local lad, William Maber, with rape. She had been staying at Mrs Maber's house, and while William's mother was away, he raped her. Like so many girls at the time, Sarah gave honest evidence, but she had no hope against society expectations of this time. How she should have reacted to the incident and how innocent she actually was when her past was considered went against her. She gave evidence that she did not call out and did not say anything about the rape for some days as she was ashamed, but was then persuaded to do so. On cross-examination, she said that she had been three times in jail, the last time for 12 months for larceny, and while there was punished for improper familiarity with one of the male prisoners. She slept one night at Mrs Mabers after the offence occurred. The police magistrate said that as Sarah had not taken the steps that any respectable girl would have taken under the circumstances, the bench would discharge Mabers. Four days after this trial in December 1867, Sarah was arrested for vagrancy and sent to Newcastle. On arrival, she was recorded as 16, but was probably closer to 14. By the time of the first riot, she had been involved in two escape attempts. Her statement to Kane about the riot provided a glimpse into one of the problems faced by many people living at this time, not just the girls at the industrial school, the problem of association. It was very common for the antecedents of any girl to be alluded to in correspondence to and from the officials at the school. Poor antecedents almost always meant that one or both parents had been transported to Australia. The view at the time was that this criminal tendency was inherited. We now know that this belief is utter rubbish, but it was why people hid their convict past. Sarah said in her statement, I joined in the disturbance. The reason I did so was that when we did anything wrong, we were told it was our parents' fault. And if we were brought up right, we should not do it. Mrs King had commented to the older girls about how they responded to locals who encouraged their misbehaviour, saying, We were like the bull and the cow. We were too hot. Other rioters repeated this same comment and added that King had said the girls needed dunking down a well to cool them off. It is having our past conduct thrown up at us that makes us feel so grieved. When I was taken to the cell on Saturday, I threatened Mrs King's life. I said I would split her head open with an axe, and I used very improper language. On Friday, we refused to undress to go to bed because a constable was on the veranda all night and a window blind was taken down so that he could see into our dormitory. The lamp was ordered to be taken out. On Saturday, some of the girls brought up some coals and wood and made a fire in the grate. We did this because we heard the lamp was going to be taken from us 
and not with any intention of setting fire to the building. Mrs King came up and ordered the fire to be taken. Five of us gathered round the fire to stop them, but they took the fire, in spite of us, and then three of us got up the chimney and blacked our faces. We objected to the way in which Miss Ravenhill addressed us. She was always reporting us unnecessarily to Mrs King and throwing up our former life to us. We picked up stones and commenced breaking the windows. I came into the dining room and took a knife, which I concealed. When I took the knife, I really meant to take the life of Mrs King, and I never stopped to consider what the consequences would be. A constable took the knife from me. Soon after the riot, Ravenhill left the school and Sarah was to attempt two further escapes from Newcastle. The last time she was also charged with larceny and sent to Maitland Jail. Five months later, Agnes King was replaced as superintendent by the military officer, Joseph Hines Clark. Despite the bad press Clark ultimately received, he documented everything and his records show that he was innovative, compassionate and was respected by the inmates as firm but fair. It is very difficult to imagine how Sarah could rise above this pervasive adversity, but she eventually did, although it was probably not achieved without her being given two chances by Clark. Within months of his arrival, Clark had to make a decision about Sarah, so he wrote to the colonial secretary stating, Sarah was returned to the institution from Maitland Jail about six weeks ago. Her antecedents are such that I could not send her to any family as servant, and as I must shortly ask for her discharge in consequence of age, the school laundress has resigned and I trust you will allow me to employ her as the school laundress, as it is the only means of saving her from utter vice. The government agreed to the suggestion, so Sarah began to earn a wage. Once she left Newcastle, Clark responded to a telegram from John Ullman, the police magistrate in Goulburn, given to him by the police magistrate of Newcastle, Elena Scott. Clark stated, Sarah has been discharged from this institution with a good character for five months, and I fear very much that if the police authorities continue to point at the girl, it will be the means of preventing her from earning a respectable livelihood. Almond's response to Clark's concerns must have been positive and must have eventually paid off for Sarah. In 1871, his name appeared on the marriage certificate of Sarah Jane Hanlon and William Stubbs. Almond had had to provide permission for an underage Sarah Jane to marry because neither of her parents were available. There is no doubt that this was the Newcastle admission and Ullman would have known exactly who she was. As Sarah Stubbs, Sarah Jane became a midwife and a respected citizen in Sydney. She died in 1929, leaving a large number of descendants. As for Agnes King, she remained within the school, taking on the role of matron of the Newcastle Reformatory that opened on the same site as the Industrial School in January 1869. In the fourth podcast in the Bad Girls series, I will discuss the difference between an industrial school and the reformatory, and I will tell the story of the most notorious of all of the Newcastle admissions. A poignant story indeed, and a sad indictment on the policies and practices of those in authority in 19th century New South Wales. Fortunately for Sarah, though, and due to one progressive thinking superintendent, she took advantage of the opportunities offered, and we can only hope that her future life was happy and rewarding. We hope you will join us again on Newcastle Family History Society podcasts. (laughs) 